Dred Scott's image was that individual who was denied his freedom, that individual who was treated poorly by the courts, that individual whose case the nation had lost. This is a case that split the United States in two. It could never really be healed through conventional means. Dred Scott was born into slavery in Virginia. His long struggle for freedom was one link in a chain of events that would eventually free more than four million enslaved people. It is unclear who the Scots belonged to at the time of Dred Scott's birth, but they were eventually sold to Peter Blow and moved to St. Louis, Missouri. Purchased in a Missouri slave market by Army Dr. John Emerson, Scott was brought to Fort Snelling in 1836 by way of Fort Armstrong in Illinois. John Emerson is an Army surgeon, and when John Emerson is posted to various frontier forts, uh, the first one is in what is today Rock Island, Illinois, he takes Dred Scott with him as his servant. Now, presumably, Dred Scott becomes free the moment he's taken to Rock Island because Rock Island is in Illinois. It's called Fort Armstrong at the time. But Dred Scott remains a slave at Fort Armstrong. And then his master takes him to Fort Snelling, which is today St. Paul, Minnesota. The slaves in Minnesota were different than the slaves in the South. They made the beds, they made the food, and did the things that the people who were officers couldn't do for themselves. I think we see Dred Scott more as a personal manservant um, or like a butler or steward. Anything that Dr. Emerson needed, Dred was going to be taking care of that. But it is a very different culture than Virginia. He may have seen this as the lesser of two evils. And when he came to Fort Snelling, there was already a young girl slave, Harriet, owned, if she could be owned, in free territory by Major Lawrence Tolliver. Major Tolliver was leaving for the winter. And he wasn't going to take Harriet with him. And the way to leave her there was to leave her married to somebody who was going to be within the protection of the fort's walls. Scott and his wife Harriet remained at Fort Snelling until 1840. Dr. Emerson died in 1843 and left his wife Irene to manage the slaves for the time being. The Scots attempted to buy their own freedom, but they were denied. It became obvious that their only recourse would be the court system. When John Emerson's widow remarried, she transferred ownership of Dred Scott to her brother, John Sanford. John Sanford lives in New York, but has business interests in St. Louis. And so now Dred Scott can sue in federal court alleging he is a citizen of Missouri, his owner is a citizen of New York. And that's how the case goes forward to the Supreme Court. No suit pressed by a slave had ever come before the Supreme Court before. It raised important questions. The lawyers representing John Sanford made the argument that no black person can sue in federal court because black people can't be citizens of the United States. The issue of freedom arose because Illinois was a free state where slavery was not allowed to exist. The Scots felt that their travels to a free state thus ended their status as slaves. They should have been allowed to walk away from the situation under the protection of Illinois law. However, since they waited to file the case until they were back in St. Louis, they would have to file the case in Missouri. Their first attempt ended in a retrial. However, in 1850, a jury in Missouri found that Dred Scott and his wife Harriet had been illegally kept in slavery. They were one of at least 300 slaves who had sued for freedom in the St. Louis courts before. The majority of them won because they, like the Scots, had lived in free territory. In the midst of dramatic national events, the Missouri State Supreme Court reversed an earlier decision, granting Dredd and Harriet their freedom. The victory did not last long, because in 1852, the Missouri Supreme Court overturned the decision, saying access to free land did not mean freedom for slaves. The case took an odd turn in 1852, when the Scots launched another effort to earn their freedom, this time by challenging John A. Sanford in federal court. 
as the brother-in-law of Dr. John Emerson. He was in fact the legal owner of the Scott family and not Irene Emerson. Scott and his lawyers challenged Sanford in another federal court where again they were defeated. Left with no other option, Dredd and Harriet took the case to the United States Supreme Court in the landmark case of Dred Scott v. Sanford. The result of the case would go far beyond anything the people involved would have ever imagined. The Supreme Court was a decidedly partisan institution. Of the nine Supreme Court justices, seven were pro-slavery Democrats. Five came from slaveholding families. Their desire to secure the rights of slaveholders would cause them to make the most infamous judicial decision in American history. The case came to the United States Supreme Court after 11 years of litigation. 11 years, the Scots were in limbo. The Scots based their United States Supreme Court case on their residence in lands that were part of the Old Northwest Territory and the 1820 Missouri Compromise, territory where slavery was prohibited. As America's new boundary lines were being drawn during the presidency of James Monroe, the nation's population reached 10 million. During this period of explosive growth, new states were being added almost every year, and the issue of slavery increasingly divided the nation. Mississippi was added to the Union in 1817 as a slave state, meaning a state in which slavery was legal. The next year, Illinois was added as a free state, meaning a state in which slavery was banned. And in 1819, Alabama was added as a slave state. At that point, the number of free and slave states was equal. However, the application by Missouri for statehood as a slave state threatened to upset this balance unless the U.S. Congress took decisive action. The leaders of the northern free states claimed Congress had the right to prohibit slavery in Missouri as well as any other new states created west of the Mississippi River. But the leaders of the southern slave states strongly resisted this notion. They feared that if the balance of power was shifted in favor of the free states, slavery might be made illegal and undermine the South's slave-based economy. In 1820, Congressman Henry Clay of Kentucky helped enact a law called the Missouri Compromise, designed to appease both sides. This law allowed Missouri to be admitted as a slave state, but it banned slavery from the entire region north of the Missouri Compromise line that corresponded to its southern boundary. It is interesting to note that while the Missouri Compromise was being worked out, Voters in the state of Massachusetts decided to create a new free state from northern lands that had been a part of Massachusetts since early colonial times. So that when the state of Maine entered the Union in 1820, it balanced the influence of the new slave state of Missouri In their landmark 1857 decision, the court declared that Congress had acted unconstitutionally in passing those enactments. Consider the extent of that. The United States Supreme Court declared that the freedom provision under the Northwest Ordinance was unconstitutional. The Scots would have no basis to claim their freedom under that. Further, on a technical matter, in order to get a case into federal court, you had to be a citizen of one of the states. The court, in a 7-2 decision, declared that the Scots were not citizens of any state. Not only did Dred and Harriet lose, their slavery be maintained, the secondary dimension of this was that no persons of color, free persons of color as well, were deemed to have any rights that white men were deemed to respect. The majority opinion in Dred Scott was written by Chief Justice Roger Taney. Taney was a resolute foe of racial equality, the Republican Party, and the anti-slavery movement. It was on that day that Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Roger Taney, spoke on behalf of the majority of justices when he proclaimed African Americans to be property and not citizens of America.
The black race has, for more than a century, been regarded as beings of an inferior order, and they have no rights which the white man is bound to respect. Chief Justice Tawney begins by saying Dred Scott can't sue because blacks can't be citizens. Um, and he makes a very famous statement. He says at the time of the Constitution, they had no rights, they meaning blacks, had no rights that the white people needed to respect. Now, having said that Dred Scott can't sue, the technical legal thing Tawney should have done was said case dismissed. Because obviously if Dred Scott can't sue, then he can't be in court. Tawney can't hear the case any longer. But Chief Justice Taney didn't stop there. Taney goes on to face another constitutional question, the question of whether Congress could constitutionally have passed the Missouri Compromise. Did Congress have the power to prohibit slavery in the Western territories? And here he makes an argument based on the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution. The Fifth Amendment says you cannot be deprived of your property without due process of law. And so he makes the argument that the federal territories cannot ban slavery because slavery is a fundamentally protected property within the United States constitutional scheme. This decision sent shockwaves through our nation and dramatically increased tensions between pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces in the United States. It would eventually become one of several events that led to the American Civil War. We fearlessly declare that there never was under the whole heaven a more atrocious, wholesale wickedness perpetrated upon the bench of justice than this. Such a decision cannot stand. All that is merciful and just on earth and in heaven will execrate and despise this edict of Tani. The nation has achieved a triumph. Sectionalism has been rebuked and abolitionism has been staggered and stunned. We have watched with increasing anxiety the progress of the opinions of the United States Court on the Dred Scott case, till it has finally reached a conclusion, literally making slaveholding legal throughout all the northern states. The antipathy that was directed at the United States Supreme Court by newspapers was extraordinarily strong. The self-satisfaction that southern newspapers reported was equally strong. It is one of the most atrocious law opinions that has ever disgraced the history of At the a single States. blow, it shatters and destroys the platform of the Republican Party. Five of the Supreme Court's nine silk gowns are worn by slaveholders. The Dred Scott decision will bring the enemies of the South face to face with the Constitution of their country. We can but foresee that this decision will create everywhere a profound sensation. This very attempt to blot out forever the hopes of an enslaved people may be one necessary link in the chain of events preparatory to the downfall and complete overthrow of the whole slave system. I'm not sure that the Dred Scott case itself would have caused the Civil War if South Carolina hadn't been primed to secede. Their decision was in part based on Northern reaction to Dred Scott. There couldn't be a legislative compromise because the Supreme Court decision took away congressional power to eliminate slavery. There was no political future short of civil war. After the court case, they were still legally considered slaves. Dredd and Harriet eventually did acquire their freedom. Dredd died as a free man. Dred Scott was born as a slave in Virginia in the 1790s. He was sold to John Emerson, a doctor in the U.S. Army. He allowed Dred Scott to marry and they had two daughters. Emerson eventually died and Scott sued the widow for his freedom. He claimed that he should be set free because he was illegally held when his master took him to Illinois and Wisconsin, both free territories. The case eventually made it up to the Supreme Court as Dred Scott versus Sanford. Sanford was the brother of Emerson's widow. The case was decided on March 6, 1857, just two days after Buchanan's inauguration. The court held that it did not have jurisdiction over the case because Dred Scott was not a citizen of the United States. 
Since the Constitution only gives the federal government the authority between citizens of different states, Scott needed to be a citizen to have a valid case. They pointed to colonial laws in the text of the Declaration of Independence and Constitution. The Fifth Amendment says that no one can be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process. The court said that someone cannot lose their property of slaves just because they went to a state or territory where slavery was illegal. It declared the Missouri Compromise unconstitutional because it would deprive property as well. This was only the second time in American history that the Supreme Court said an act of Congress was unconstitutional. Seven justices agreed with the decision, and two did not. The dissenting justices said that blacks could become citizens because at the time of the founding, they could vote in 10 out of the 13 states, which would overturn much of the argument. This case did not settle the issue of slavery once and for all as the South hoped. Instead, the decision was considered very offensive in the North and strengthened the abolitionist movement and the new Republican Party. Dred Scott's and his family's freedom was purchased, but he died less than two years after being freed. Dred's role is one of an agent of change. He didn't accept his circumstance, nor did his wife. They sought change not only for themselves, but for their future generations. Dred Scott and his family remained slaves for a brief period of time following the Supreme Court ruling. The Scott family was eventually purchased by previous owners, the Blow family, and on May 26, 1857, Dred, Harriet, Eliza, and Lizzie Scott were set free. Their tenure as slaves had ended. Dred and his family settled in St. Louis, where Dred took up a part-time job as a porter. Sadly enough, Dredd passed away in September of that same year after a battle with tuberculosis. He never lived to see the end of the Civil War or the end of slavery in America. There is no doubt that his memory was present when the United States passed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution. His family lived on long after Dredd's passing, with his wife surviving nearly 20 years and his daughters even more. Dred Scott was a man who lived his entire life as a slave. He only tasted freedom for a short period of time. However, his story would go on to play an important role in inspiring the actions of major historical figures, including Frederick Douglass and President Abraham Lincoln. In 1997, a memorial was created to honor the story of Dred Scott. That memorial was placed on the grounds of the old courthouse in St. Louis, Missouri, a place where the efforts will always be remembered. All persons held as slaves within any state, the people of which shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. Now the fate of the Union and the fate of slavery were one and the same.